episode 451 of just joshing the officially episode 51 she closed out my last interview was on just an audio only show now she's here as a first as a video interview on twitch which will eventually also be on youtube which will also be an audio for my podcast i'm kind of crazy i i uh it's everything but, at once. Well, I yeah, don't, that's, that's the I idea. don't think I've been on Twitch before, so I'm a Twitch virgin. Yeah, so well, I, I took your I took your Twitch virginity. I'm damn, sorry. I damn. The I crossed the ferry. I crossed well, the ferry. That's why I've got bourbon. That's right. So, Cheers. A walk, walk of shame for later. Cheers to the walk. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No longer a Twitch virgin. That's right. Uh, that's okay. I mean. I didn't expect it, but you never expect it. No, it's okay. Listen, just just listen. When you have the walk of shame, just just like build me up really good, okay? Just because you know, I mean, you know, you're gonna do a walk of shame. You gotta do it. You got you gotta at least build yourself up a little bit because when you when you wake up the next day and you're with somebody that you wouldn't have ever thought about sober or in a right mind, you know, you gotta build yourself up a little bit because if you don't, uh, people have this tendency to you know. Uh, look down on you even harder than you look down on yourself. And, and you're already guilty fucking enough, yeah. like, you know. So I did, um, I had a burlesque troupe for five years and our very last show was called Once Upon a Time. And we took fairy tales and like stuff from our childhood and gave it like a weird, sexy twist. So there's this song called Walk of Shame and it's a, a bluesy foxtrot. So I did a reverse burlesque with it. So it was all the Disney princesses and we start out nearly naked <laughs> on the floor all screwed up empty pill bottles and empty booze bottles all around us and then we wake up and we're like where the am i where the beep am i and we're like waking each other up and our sleeping beauty just won't wake up because she's literally <laughs> holding a bottle at ambien and then uh so the whole thing is just us trying to figure out where we are which prince we accidentally banged because they pop out like halfway through, like, how do you want your eggs? And we're like, oh God, yuck. Uh, and we're trying to put our princess outfits back on. I was Ariel, the little mermaid. So like, I had to like wiggle into like a fish outfit. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, at, least, at, at least the punchline wasn't the seven dwarfs. I mean, I, I mean um, that, 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 that was like, that was what I was thinking when he first mentions like, Seriously, that would be like the worst thing. You go to Snow White's house for a party, see all the poison, all there's wonderful yeah. stuff. There would have to be drugs there. I mean, you're living with seven very angry little men. There, yeah. there has to be at least some kind, either good, really we, good things. We did have a Snow White and she was covered with like little doll panties and things like that where she was like, oh, oh no. Like, how yeah. many of the dwarves did I bang? And I mean, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, who didn't I bang? And it's like, right. well, poor Grumpy. Poor. I remember when uh, my prince came out, was actually played by my husband, and I just looked at him. I can swear on this, right? Oh, you told I am. Okay, I looked at him in character because I was a little mermaid, and I went, fish fucker. <laughs> and everybody in the audience just laughed because I was like, you fucked me, and I'm half a fish. Uh, and he was like, whoa. Yeah, he's okay. like, eh, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and then that, that's what I mean. So that's my walk of shame story. If you haven't heard the song, it's a great song. It's actually a foxtrot or a West Coast swing. So it's like real bluesy and sexy. But it's all about waking up, not knowing where you are, not knowing where your keys are. And then some rando dude comes out and literally says, how do you want your eggs? And you're like, fuck, I got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no, I, I, I wish I could say I was that adventurous. But honestly... By and large, pretty picky with who I've ended up sleeping with. It, That's uh, good. It, yeah. That's a good thing to be. Yeah. Well, I, I I learned. See, I learned something. So I I when I was a when I was a kid, my dad would beat this into me. If you get anyone pregnant, life as you know it would come to an end. Yeah. And that's actually a really good piece of advice as a teenager. It it's even a good piece of advice for me now. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a life lesson. Yeah, just that's like a life lesson. That, right? You take that into your 20s, 30s, and 40s. Well, well, and 50s, if you're and a guy. Possibly, and even possibly 60s. It's not impossible. As it does happen. Charlie Chaplin had babies, I think, until his early 80s. Yeah, so I mean, it's the way it goes, right? So I, so here's the thing. I, I still remember this. I had, I had an ex-girlfriend that in high school, high school girlfriend. I had the, actually the opportunity to get intimate. Something just told me no. Like, yeah. like, like really like just told me no. And I didn't. And like the next day or two days later, I find out she's pregnant. She got with somebody else 
And it was like, I think I, and with all due respect to her, I think I literally walked away with like, like, whoo. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, I, I've always like, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not made of wood, but I've also, I've learned, I've learned very, I've learned that generally speaking that, um, you know, especially as I've gotten older, you're, the quality of the people you're with matters in every aspect of your life, like mm-hmm. every single aspect of your life. And if you don't, if you, if you settle for anything, it will literally lead you into everything you don't want. Yeah. To. It literally haunts you. Um, so when I was little, I was very, very conservative in high school. Nobody thought so. Cause I was like a freak kid, pale skin, bright red lips, weirdo mm-hmm. clothes, uh, but when I was, I think two or three, my mom went to a psychic and the psychic told her that I would get pregnant in high school. Whether this happened to my mother or not, or whether it was just a tale she told me to make me petrified of intercourse during high school, either way it worked. I didn't bang anybody in high school because every boy even made out with, I was like, no, a psychic told my mom I was going to get pregnant. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that is like such a boner killer in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's awkward. It's, it's the last thing you expect to hear from from a, from a gal you're, you're, you're fooling around with, number one. Number two, you, now you're thinking about what you're doing for a second. Now it's like, yeah. wait a minute, do I really think this is a good idea to go past a certain point? Yeah. And then, then by the time that thought's in there, you're done. Like you're just, you're, you're, you're absolutely done just. And there's that lingering thing of like, I brought up my mom yeah. while I was like, you know, going to third base with somebody. And they're like, you're thinking about your mom right now? And I'm like, dude, I have guilt issues. I'm afraid of getting pregnant because a psychic said something. What do you want me to do? Just let you get me pregnant and then say, I knew it. The psychic told my mom. <laughs> that's a worse ending. <laughs> that's like that that's a terrible ending and that, yeah. that psychic would be worth their weight in gold so i mean <laughs> kind of but at the same time like that's not what you want like you don't want that um so no like i i have, i've gotten older slash wiser or something to that effect anyway yeah exactly like yeah maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, I i it's qual like i it's funny it, it's i understand why when you get older you have a lot less people in your life I, I uh, coming back to Windsor, um, I see my dad and I go, and he doesn't really have a lot of people in his life. I think it's too much the other way with him. I think a little mm-hmm. bit in the sense that he probably could use some more help in some things. Now he probably would tell me go fuck myself, but this is how <laughs> I see it, right? Um, but at the same time, at the same time, I get it because you you don't want just anybody there. You want people that actually want to be there. You want people that actually care about you to be there otherwise why are why are they there like yeah. you, you you get you get to the point in your life where you're like i just don't want to waste time with people like do you want if you want to be here great i will ha- i'm happy but if you don't want to be here like please go just please I, go. I mean, yeah. yeah it's true i mean i think and again i mentioned this i'm only awake for six hours a day i mean i'm awake for many more hours but i'm only like really vitally awake for six hours a day Enjoy. probably uh, I mean, I'm awake like 22 hours a day because I also have insomnia, but I'm brain dead for most of them. Uh, but for my, let's say, six to eight hours of my life that I'm like fully able to communicate with humans, want to communicate with humans, I can write, I can teach, I can do anything. Out of those eight hours, who do I want to spend that with? People that really don't give a shit about me? Or, Not really. you know, you don't. And you get to a certain age where you just, you, I agree, you want the people with you that, that want to be with you. And I think in, in my life, I've been a performer and I've been a dance teacher and I've been all these things that can sometimes seem exciting. They're not. They're just normal jobs like everything else. But some people can like see that lifestyle and see, oh, that's exciting. I want to be close to the ballroom dancing stripper girl. That's fun. But at the end of the day, I'm like here taking care of my elderly mom and like making food and do like, yeah, yeah. and I like, I'm not just always like the person that's out there, like the personality, well, uh, the stage and, presence. 
you, you, I mean, we all have a stage presence. I mean, I'm, except okay, I'm pretty much the same the same guy whether I'm on the stage or off the stage because I I have like I just, I give zero fucks. I mean, I really just like it's just one of those. This is me. If you like it, great. If you don't, well, yeah, 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 that's me, right? I always say stripper Jennifer has glitter and a spray tan, but still like a surly attitude. Most, but, most yeah. I, 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 my, I uh, when I was in college, I, two of my classmates were strippers. It's really interesting. It, it is the weirdest dichotomy of, of, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or Miss Hyde I've ever seen. In one case, because I think she just, I've seen people really get into that lifestyle, and if they really get into it, they they have this like really sweet core personality. It's like really endearing, and then they also have like this monster inside them. That's right, right. right. <laughs> I think it's the nature of the. I think it's the nature of the business they're in. You, you're putting generally a very intimate part of your stuff out there for for the purposes of business. Yeah. And and I think I never thought of it as business because I never worked in a club. Um, yeah. I respect people that worked in clubs. That's awesome. I don't think I could do it just because again I'm only awake until six p.m. at night, and that's not necessarily when clubs are open. Uh, so I always did burlesque, but I did it in like theaters or I did dance in bars and places like that. But I I never was that. I, there was it always came from a theatrical background for me, so I never thought of it as. Um, you were more telling a story. Like, I like, was. Really, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were more really telling. Was. Yeah, you were more telling a story, and I mean, burlesque dancers tend to. I mean, yes, they, they, they. There is something. There is something about what they give that that adds to the imagination, adds a little excitement to it. But in essence, if you look at what a burlesque dancer does, they they tend to tell a story with what they, with the whatever tools they have to to do it. Um, a stripper, like an like a like like a, like a stripper. They can do that. I mean, they are fulfilling a fantasy, mm -hmm. but I think the re I think the end goal is a little different. All right, I, is there's a, there's a little bit more there's a little bit more um, there's a little less storytelling, more money shot. Maybe I'm I wrong on say, that. See, I again, I've never done it personally, but I have lots of friends that did. But I think the only difference to me. And I could definitely be wrong is working in a club versus being a burlesque performer on stage, having it be art or having it be in a club. I think the being in a club makes it a business and you're mm -hmm. there to make money. Yeah. So to me, working in a club is the same way as writing a book that you know is commercial and you're still writing it and it's still art, but you're writing that one because you know, it's going to sell when you're in a club, you're doing what you know is going to sell. Yeah. Not what you think is going to make the people go, oh, that one really touched my heart. Yeah. Like that one moved my soul. Okay, that's fair. I, I, they're they're going to say, oh, that one really made me move my wallet and chuck all these ones at you because it's a job. Yes. Um, yeah. It's or, a sexually empowering job at times, but it is a job. So you're there yeah. to make money. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it, there's, there's definitely a business aspect to it. And it's not a terror. Again, I'm not. It, it, look, there's lots of people, but I think there's also this fact that you're, I can't speak from the burlesque point of view, but I mean, I'm just in the bars, there's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of other yeah. substances involved there, and that makes, that can make things very murky, at least one of my friends there, um, I remember her, there was, again, she was super nice, but there was that side of her been like, ooh, right, but that's, that, again, you get messed around, you have to protect yourself, and, and, and as I've also gotten older, I'm a lot more. It's it's funny. I can I can I can see a lot more where people are just trying to protect themselves, and it puts me in a really awkward spot sometimes with people where it's like, I think you're going too far, but I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Right. It, it, and it, it's it's a weird spot because it's like, do I tell them to stop, or do I just carry on? And it's a boundary issue both ways, like my yeah. boundaries and their boundaries, and it's like. Can I live with this? And actually, that's what ultimately I ask. Can I live with what they're doing? The answer is yes. I will let it pass. The answer is no. It's like okay, man. I need to do so. I need to. I need to say something here. But mm -hmm. as I've gotten older, it's gotten harder to actually because again, I maybe I'm maybe too empathetic there. I don't know. Like it's almost one of those. Yeah, you know, I've gotten you know, much more open-minded the older I get. You mm -hmm. know, truthfully. 
um, from that like virgin girl in high school who was like, I am not going to do anything. Now I'm just like, look, if you're not hurting anybody, like if you're physically not hurting anybody and it's not illegal, like you're not doing something terrible to a child or an animal. <laughs> okay. I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fine with whatever you do. Y yeah, as long yeah. as you're not hurt. And again, then there's that, if it's somebody you care about, really care about, and you think they're hurting themselves. Oh, see, that's I, tricky. That okay? So this is. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to conservative to to one of my actually a Bible quote. Ironically, and not Jesus would always ask somebody when he went to heal somebody, "Do you wish to be healed?" Think about that one for a second. Why would he ask that question? Well, because you can't help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves. Exactly. All right, but it, to really have that sink in, because a lot of people are used to having carrying a certain thing. Going back to, you know, I recognize the fact that people are comfortable in their lives, even if it's hurting them. There's always a degree. We all have it. We all do things to ourselves that probably we shouldn't. But the honest truth of the matter is we're comfortable with those things, whatever those things are. Mm -hmm. And that's our, that, the thing is, I think where most of us are a little dishonest with ourselves is we sometimes think there isn't going to be consequences to anything we're doing. Like we're invincible. No, no, we're not. Yes, we're going to pay for this stuff somewhere down the road. The real question then is, what, are you willing to pay that price? If the answer is yes, there's nothing anyone really can say to you. Because right. honestly, you, you've thought this through. You know the risk. You're being honest with yourself. And if you are hurting yourself, you're okay with it. So why would I or anybody else for that matter judge you right I, you can't there's just like you've made you've thought this out mm -hmm. it, right it's it's um it's when sometimes people don't think in those terms maybe that's when you should say something and sometimes people are dishonest with themselves with those yeah terms. And that's, that's that's when so i think you know like going back to that whole friendship thing and get having the people in your life that you want to be have in your life I don't think there's anything wrong with like saying to one of your friends who you see actively maybe possibly hurting themselves saying, I'm concerned for you. It's not going to stop me from loving you, but I am concerned. This is what I see happening. And if they're like, I don't give two fucks, then you go, okay, you, yeah. you well, step back. You've done your job. Yeah. Or, or I'm okay with this. That's yeah. It. There's nothing else to be said. Um, there, it, I am okay with doing this to myself because at that, at that point, then this is a, this is the other thing I, uh, like we talked a little bit about this again, nature of love is, do you trust somebody enough to let them do their thing, whatever that is and figure it out on their own? If you can do that, if you can honestly do that, you really do love someone, right? And, mm -hmm. and you trust them because they'll figure it out. But even if they don't, I mean, you still love them. It's kind of one of those. Once I, I, I realized, I thought about love in those terms, it's made, again, I, it's very hard for me to really, really be mad at anybody for a sustained yeah. period of time because it's just like, okay, I get it. I don't, sometimes I don't understand, right? Sometimes I don't, but I mean, by and large, I get it. Like everybody's got to live their life on their terms. And they, yeah. I mean, we are here once we have like this experience once. So if I can, I can't really like condemn anybody for like doing no. anything anymore. And also just me being Josh Pentelaresco, the podcaster, I had to throw, I had to throw judgment out the door when I did shows like this. Like I had to throw my own. It's, it's an interesting balance is I'm open to everything. I have to be open to everything to do this, but it's also where for me, it's interesting is I always have to reevaluate my own convictions on things too. And yeah. it's been really interesting. It's been really interesting to watch how I've evolved in that in the last few years. Now, maybe I'll get to a point like, fuck it, this is what I believe. And if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. So, I mean, I might, I might get to that point. So, but, I, I have very strong core beliefs, uh, whether those are politically or spiritually. But mm -hmm. I've been, um, for like the past 11 years, I've been a ballroom dance teacher. And I teach anyone who walks through that door. Anybody can be my student. Um, and sometimes, and half of my job was getting to know them, getting to know why they walked in that door. And not everybody that walked through that door shared my beliefs politically, emotionally, 
anything. And sometimes they say things that you're just like, what the fuck? Uh, but it doesn't negate why they walked in the door. Like there was something in them that wanted to learn how to dance. There was something in them that wanted to connect with somebody. And even though I disagreed with them, there's always something to love about a person. Sometimes you can't like the person, but there is something lovable sure. about, about most people. And so I've always found that with my students, gotten past my own beliefs. Uh, but that being said, where I've taught has always been, I've taught in a very liberal city. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of people coming in and saying things that are just like horrifyingly bad to me. Like n very few open racists. <laughs> Every once in a while, a little bit, a little bit, but, it, but it, very few over the many years I've done this. Well, see, it's interesting because here up, up here in Canada, I mean, it, we do have a, we do, there are racist undertones here so in some places, right? The only difference I think between where you're at and where I'm at is you guys are a lot more flagrant with it by and large. It's not, it's not yeah. so. It's gross. It, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's gross but it's right out in the open. You can see it plain as day. Sometimes the more insidious versions are those like hidden signs you never see. Right. So right. I, I live in the Northeast, um, which is by and large, very liberal. It's, you know, we're not seeing a lot of Confederate flags mm -hmm. being flown up here. You know, you get uh, into different parts in the country and they are very open with the racism. Here it's tricky. There are people who are like loud and proud, racist, but every once in a while you get shocked. Like mm -hmm. people that I've been friends with for years or at least close acquaintances with for many years will all of a sudden say something and you're like, what? Like, I thought you were a normal, caring, loving person. Yeah. but I mean <laughs> And then you say something that's so filled with hate. Well, it, it's, it's also just, it, okay, so I also look at it like from a, some of it's generational in some cases. Like I look at like how my grandmother views things, how I view things are very different. And the thing I remember too, she's been on this planet for 80 years. So her, what the messages she had when she was a kid have been beaten into her for a very, 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 very long time. Some of those aren't going to change. There's just no way. It just, it's just been, it, it, and we all have this, I think, to some degree. We mm -hmm. all have our own biases and paradoxes. Like, we try to be open, but the truth of the matter is, we all have our biases. We all have our things we discriminate against. We all have our flaws. And, I, like I said, some of it is generational. Some of it is, I think where I think where it's really, really painful is when you can see that the ignorance was taught. Like, I, I remember... I was going to San Diego Comic Con one year, so I was I was taking the uh, Greyhound bus from Phoenix, Arizona. I was in Phoenix. Oh gosh, what a trip that must have been! Oh, it was fun. Greyhound bus anywhere is a is a is a, a a lesson everybody in the world should learn. No, no, and I'll give you the city you should do it in, and that's LA. I did it in LA. Oh. That's that's a while. I'll, I'll tell that story afterwards. But I oh, went oh. through Baltimore. That's about the same. That's yeah. about yeah. It's about the I same. Like, um, <laughs> so so here here's my here's my Phoenix story. This is the, my Phoenix racism story. So I meet this really pretty girl in there, Dex Te Dex and Juan, very pretty. I've seen somebody, but that doesn't mean I didn't I, I, I didn't I didn't mind what I saw. I wasn't going to do anything with it, but I was just like I, I it's like okay, pretty woman. <laughs> we're, we're just sitting we're just sitting here killing some time, and I'm like okay, this is good. Then she asked a question about about um, did black people have a soul? And I was like, what the <gasps> oh, like that? Oh, it got worse. <laughs> it got worse. The bus driver was black. She saw him. I don't know what she said to him, but it was very. It, it shook him to his core, and he did not deserve that. I, it was no. one, it was one of the most brutal. She got. She didn't get on the bus at all. They wouldn't let her go on the bus. But the moment she said that, it's like, okay, I'm out. Like, I'm out. And I, I backed away. And, and, and so the one other, again, pretty gal, but just like, holy, like someone taught her that. Like someone oh. taught her that. And and then and then you, you see that's like, that's the most racist thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was there. The second was in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And do the native population up here. 
it was it was like it was just like again it's anywhere and people are and it's all over the world people from all over the world can be very racist um but my greyhound experience eh. <laughs> okay so this is my la story this is mine so i went to, I actually lived in phoenix for about nine months and uh but i decided that okay so i had this option i could go to denver or I could go to la for a day and then just t- i thought in my head i had this the dumb idea because the, the greyhounds in canada are not the same as the greyhounds in the united states there's a lot less greyhounds in canada now <laughs> but they're only in ontario and they're only in um uh, quebec now but they used to go across the country and I, mm-hmm. I did that trip and those trips were really and again canada's a much prettier a little less violent place to, to do about fun. the trip this is my thought going to la so a couple things about la my cab was more expensive than my flight and my bus I'm sure. Yeah, it was. It was, <laughs> I am sure. It was an experience. Let me tell you. And then, then number two. So the cab driver very politely warned me not to get in cars with any strangers. I pulled up to the state. I pulled up to the station. Some of the meanest, toughest people. And I've, I've lived in. I've like I've seen some of the rougher neighborhoods in Detroit. I'm like, oh wow, I'm in one of these neighborhoods. Lovely. So my my master plan of like, hey, I'll explore some of LA, have a good time, and go. No, I'm I'm in the bus station because. I am, I'm not going to be, like, if I get out, if I leave this bus station, there's a very good chance I ain't going back in the bus station, right? They never put bus stations in the best neighborhoods. Like, no, you, you always end up like, oh, I've got seven hours to kill. I'm just going to meander around the city. And I've had the same experience where you, like, literally start to walk out of the bus station. You're like, I'm about to get murdered. Yes. <laughs> and then, so I went to, from Columbus, Ohio to New York City via bus. And I remember just being at the first bus station and seeing people at the bus station in Columbus laying on the floor sound asleep. And I was like, oh God, why would you sleep on the floor of a bus station? Cut to, you know, m- many hours later and we were stranded in the Baltimore bus station for God knows how long. Cause like another bus just never freaking came. Mm-hmm. And we're like, well, we can wander around. Oh, it's short, certain death you leave. And it's like people with knives and we're just standing there. There's no seats. And eventually uh, my now husband and I laid on the floor of the bus station, like on our backpacks. And we just looked at each other and we're like, were bus people. It was like less than 24 hours and you become a bus station person where you're like, I'm just going to sleep on the floor. <laughs> no, it's just like, like you, you got nowhere else to go. And, and you know what really kills you too? This really poor neighborhood you're in, you can actually see the nice neighborhood. They're not no. that far away. They're not that far away. You're like, oh, I see it. It's so pretty. It's so, it, but you're like, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to make it. Like something will happen to my bags. Something will happen to me. On the flip side, I mean, my, I don't know about you, I, there's this, this wonderful gentleman, he opened up his thing and he had, he had all this jewelry that was like, <laughs> fantastically there. No tax. I mean, that's just, I mean, there's no tax. It was right there. All you had to do was have the cash on you. Yeah, it was, no, I was, that was a, that was a hell, like never again. And, and I'm sure LA is a nice place, but I preferred San Diego. San Diego was a wonderful city. LA was not so good to me and I'm not quite sure I'm ever going to go back to LA. I've never been. And, but I've always been, yeah, like leery. I know it's expensive to travel like anywhere. Like once you're in LA to get anywhere else in LA, like you said, the cab ride is going to be more than your flight. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, I I try to travel on the cheap. So I know Mm -hmm. LA is not really, hence why I took a bus from Columbus, Ohio to New York City. Yeah. (laughs) It was like $30. but, But it's also just a different it's a different mentality. New York is not built. LA is just like this weird, it's not really a city. It's a bunch of cities linked together by these weird freaking highways. That's, that's what LA is. LA's got, there's a bubble here, bubble here, bubble here, bubble here. That's LA. New York, from what I can gather, from what I've seen, is a city yeah. that, that's connected together by subways. Like, like you, you don't, you don't want to drive in New York. No. And, and, and Once you get to New York, it's, easy it really is easy yeah um even if you're staying in the boroughs even if you're in queens or bronx or brooklyn the subway does for the most part make sense and it yeah. and it's not that difficult and this is coming from somebody who 
was performing in Midtown Manhattan until two in the morning every night and then having to get a two hour subway ride all the way to Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, it was fine. It made sense. Yeah, the trains were slower in the middle of the night, but it made sense. And weirdly, for the most part, it, I felt much safer in the subway going to Bed-Stuy than I did in the bus station in Baltimore. <laughs> That's not weird at all. I heard <laughs> stories about Baltimore. They're probably on my on par with stories I heard about that part of LA. I would think. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, Baltimore is a nasty. It can be a nasty place. But I it mean, can also be really beautiful. Oh yeah, no. United so States, yeah, the United States is is a very interesting. You are both the greatest and worst country in the world. You're both. I right? agree. Yeah. Except I lately I've been heavier on the worst country in the world. You can't see my little. <clears throat> I could really depress you, but I don't think I'm going to do that. Don't. That's bad enough here. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, yeah. I. I. Yeah. I. Uh, so for me, for me, I, I've it's been like this whole weird time we're all in. I've I, I've taken to studying recent history. It's amazing how much stuff we're repeating. It's amazing. I just look at it and go, okay. And, and I again, I I'm. I wish we had taken the opportunity to talk to each other more. That honestly, that's the one thing looking looking at this at this whole time. I wish instead of fighting over whether we wear or not wear a mask, we actually took the time to actually talk to each other about where we want to go from here. Because we don't have to go back to whatever even this new normal or next normal or whatever normal looks like going forward. We, I mean, this was a re this is a real opportunity to be like to reset everything. It's like you know what, we don't need to go through this crap twice, right? <laughs> I or, hope. What I said, yeah. I hope. Yeah, that's that's it. Like I, I swear, I, I, I mean, I get to talk. So here's the thing, right? You're in the northeastern United States. I'm in I'm in Canada. We're having this conversation about well everything from burlesque to why LA is why LA is a hellhole on earth <laughs> and everything in between. And the cool thing about it is I've gotten to know you better from this and the last conversation we had as well, which was, I really enjoyed. Yes. You're a great, you were a great guest, by the way, to wrap. Thank you. Wrap the old era up. And, um, but uh, I, I wanted to, but the thing is we have this technology today to, we can actually interact with each other one-to-one -one like this all the time. And it's not the same. Like I would rather meet you over, say, a shot of like you know a beer or a brandy in a bar somewhere, and we just sit and talk about life, the universe, and everything. And maybe that day will come uh, somewhere down the road. Maybe it doesn't. But the fact of the matter is, I'm getting to talk to you here now, and we're just having it. When we're just shooting the shit. Yeah. And that's a really cool, like, unlike any other part in history, like communication across the globe is easier than it's ever been. Yeah. I mean, I have to say. Uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic, and I know we we touched on this last time, like I also have a podcast, uh, it's called Fox Vomitus, if anybody's listening. Uh, and I've gotten a chance, just like you, like you meet people that you would never have met before this. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing with my life now if the world hadn't ended. So there's there's something to be said for the world ending and yet we keep going. And well, I don't really think the world ended. I just think the world think as we uh, knew it. Ended. No, well, the world, the world, the world. Sure. Well, yeah, no. Like I, I think here's what I honestly think. I think what the world did basically is made us very much aware of our mortality in this time, regardless of what happens. Whether there's whether there's a vaccine, whether there isn't a vaccine, at some point we're all going outside again. You no, know, like at some point it's going to happen. So. Like in this moment, I mean, we are just very hyper aware that, you know, this is going to sound depressing in one sense. One day we're going to die. But that was always going to be the case no matter what. Life, like, I, I just think, you know, life is basically saying, hey, you know what? This, like, everything can go away like that tomorrow. Yeah. You know, what's funny is, so right before the lockdown, um, my husband and I, we were in Spain. And... We were in Spain and we should have been having the time of our life. And we were having a very good time during most of Spain, but we hated where we were staying. We hated Madrid. And we were just, we complained 
for a lot of the vacation about how much we hated Madrid. Oh, it's so crazy. It's so busy. There's people everywhere. Oh, getting around is difficult. Um, complain, complain, complain. Uh, the rest of Spain we loved. But then when we came home and we were in lockdown two weeks later, we just looked at each other and said, what assholes we were to be have this opportunity to be in Spain and we should have loved it more. We should have loved the traffic. We should have loved standing there being completely lost in Madrid. We should have loved the expensive tax, taxi cab rides. We should have loved the fact that uh, there was a bull fighting like ring in the middle of the city. Even though I hate all of that, we should have loved it because we experienced it. But instead we complained about it. And now we've been in the house for like nine and a half months. And we're just like, I can't believe the last vacation we went on. We spent, I will say, 30% of the vacation complaining. It's going to be we're very different. so mad. I'm like, I want to go back to Madrid and not complain. I'll go anywhere and not complain. Well, well that, that's the thing is that, that chance is going to come again. Like, I, so this is like phase one of my master plan to turn this into like the international phenomenon. Like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself, like I said, this really, really quirky ass mystery machine. And I'm going to just drive around the country and I'm going to like, yeah, maybe show up at your door and say, "Hey, Jen, hi, Miss Jen. Would you like to go through that drink in the bar?" And we'll like we'll, we'll like <laughs> like and we'll just have this drink and we'll just talk about life, the universe, and everything. And then maybe I'll end up in California meeting somebody else, going, "Hey, you want to do this? like I, I I recognize that like for me this 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 forced me to look at what really mattered to me. Yeah, right. And where I want to go going forward. And for me, it's like. I don't want to work for people anymore. I, right. I'm too. I'm too. I'm too old. I'm way too old for that. <laughs> you think I'm laughing, but I'm not joking. About I'm laughing because I'm probably like I'm way older than you. Yeah, but it's see, but see, it's just that realization. Like I realized for me that I, I only have life is short on time, but long on possibilities. And the fact of the matter is, I want to do more of these things that are possible. And like, no matter what happens next year, like I said, good, bad, or indifferent, no matter what happens next year, I'm going to be looking at making my dream, those dreams a reality, one way or the other. I, I, I don't care. I'm willing to take those risks. I'm willing to do those consequences. I'm willing to go through with that journey, no matter what it is. And that's like, again, talking about what we said earlier about, you know. We all have to like, own up to the risk we take in this life. I own up to the risk I take in this life. And I realize that, you know, they're my risk and I, and I have to do it because I'm here to do what I'm supposed to do. So, yeah, and that's, that's it. it. That's it. Right. So yeah. I'm going to do it. And really, I don't like the world can be on fire. That's cool. I'm still going <laughs> to figure I, I'm still going to be on fire. Yeah. So we uh, I got married a couple of weeks ago. I got married on Halloween. And we got some lovely presents uh, and cards from people. And I appreciated every single one of them. But the thing that meant the most to me was we have two friends. Their names are Bill and Julie. And they gave us their travel book that they used when they went to Budapest. Because they had known that that was going to be our honeymoon. And we couldn't take it. So they gave us this well-worn book about Budapest and almost every page there's a post-it note attached to something based on one of their experiences like don't get a cab over here blah 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 if you go to this place walk four blocks and you can yeah, find yeah. and I was like this is the most precious gift because they were just like here because next year you'll be in Budapest yeah and I'm like thank you and that no. they gave us hope they gave us their memories they gave us the dream, the like something to look forward to. Well, 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 that's just it. I mean, this is a pause and it seems it's it seems like we haven't moved, but that's not true. We have. Right. Like like this. So the very worst case scenario isn't happening. That's a good thing. We're not the very we're not the best case scenario yet. But, <laughs> You're uh, not in the United States. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. But see, see, you. you like I said, I won't depress you. I could really depress you. I no, depress I know you. it can be much worse than it is, but we are, we're not doing as well as we definitely could have in this country. Okay, maybe I will depress you a little bit because I, I think, I think the, so. Here's what I, I reckon I realize about your country. 
the last time you had an actual pandemic, uh, or actually the last two times, the first time you did had word stock in a pandemic, right? The second time you ignored a crisis for 12 years before you started to do anything about it. So in one very real sense, and this is sad, Trump did nothing different than what any other president before him in the last 50 years have done. When Nixon was president, Woodstock happened during a flu pandemic. When when AIDS was a big thing, Reagan and Bush both ignored it, and even Clinton oh, yeah. and Clinton ignored it for his first his first term. His second term, he finally did something about it, but it took him six years. Yeah, no, so, I trust me, I get it. I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying we have the best track record. I, I, <laughs> It's, it's it's why it's why when they say well Trump's a monster it's like yeah he is but he, yeah yes oh yeah, yeah there's no there's no doubt about that but at the same time I'm like I look at what he's done it's like it's a sad truth and this is the depressing thing he's done nothing different than anyone that came before him rather than he's just pushed it to another extreme that was built in over time I'm terrified what's going to come down you guys probably in ten years like that terrifies me. Right. Uh, hopefully, I will be living in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, like that, like like that, like what I see, what I've seen down there, just go. It makes me go, oh, like because again, I've again, this is the part where I'm like, where you've been and where you are right now is completely within your track record. So based on your track record, I can figure out where you're gonna go next. And I'm like, and it sucks. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I live on the like I live in New Hampshire. So technically, my state borders Canada, but I am like a good three hours away from Canada. But I, I know, had. I, 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 did yeah, you look me I up on the map? I know where about where you are. Yeah. Um, so I have good friends that just moved right to the Canadian border on the United States side in New, in New Hampshire, where their yard is literally like a river, and then Canada. And I'm like, you are our underground railroad. That's right. We, <laughs> all we have to do is tunnel to Canada through your yard or just like fling ourselves through the river and like claim asylum. Uh, 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 how, how flowy is that river? Is it a very flowy river? It's very flowy. Okay. They're so. just like, you cannot do this. You can't swim very well. I'm like, damn it. So, so then, We're going to find then, a place to tunnel then, or then raft. A raft, a canoe, uh, like a, a little makeshift bridge, a rope yeah, bridge. Yeah, you will. Okay, here, here's the thing: if it's really flowy, I think <laughs> I, I'm gonna go with a boat. Just I reckon like a little small boat, because the chances of of you tipping over makeshift bridge if that goes like okay. So I live uh, in Windsor, Ontario. There's the Detroit River. Now the Detroit River is very has lots of undercurrents. They, back in the murder capital of the United States days. That's where all the bodies were thrown in and they'd end up in Cleveland somewhere, <laughs> right? That, that's just, it's a very flowy river, right? Yeah. So, so building a bridge, if your river's that flowy where there's that kind of undercurrent, you don't want a makeshift bridge. You want like a canoe or like something, a motorboat of some kind. Just, yeah. It doesn't have to be very, it doesn't have to be very big because it's just you and your husband and and and, and that Budapest book, you should take that with you. Yeah. That's really, that's really cool. And then go across and then you bring the book back to the United States and like this, as a board, because you're, you, you're not going to come back. You're like, fuck this. Yeah, here, oh, right? And, then, and, you, and you'll find, so let's see, New Hampshire, that would be New Brunswick or, yeah, probably New Brunswick. It's like, yeah, it's like Quebec. We're, okay. we're pretty close oh, okay. to like Quebec so, City. We're so, four and a half hours from Montreal, but we can get to Quebec uh, a little quicker than that. But so, so here's the thing: learn the good swear words in French. Just learn the good swear words. Get yourself mm -hmm. like really, really, like really, really wound up there, right? Get your French down to, to the point where you can speak. Because getting to Montreal, you, that, that you'll you'll see the Canadian racism at its finest if you don't speak the language. <laughs> um, <that's> <laughs> Luckily, my mom is fr Canadian French, so I can. I can have her start tutoring yeah, us. Yeah, she, she'll she'll put it, she'll she'll shut that up. And once you get to Montreal, you're fine. Montreal, they're the. I mean, again, some French is good, but at the very least, they'll speak English to you, and it's it's good. And once you're there, you're great. I'm encouraging my friends to smuggle into Canada. Awesome. I know. I, well, <laughs> we've been. This has been a four-year plan, uh, but 
but we had no way to really logistically get there until my friends just moved. They just moved like two months ago. And I'm like, finally, we have like a, a house really close to the border. They can, yeah, I think it's, it's a solid plan. Mainly cause, mainly cause I really want to go on vacation again. And right now in New Hampshire, we're not even allowed to leave our state. <laughs> like Vermont won't let us go. Maine won't let us go. And now Massachusetts, which has way more COVID cases, says we're the problem and the borders have closed. So it's literally, it's just us. And Canada's like, we don't fucking want you. None well, of well, you. Stay. Uh, <laughs> Massachusetts is a blessing in the sky. <laughs> it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a blessing. I'd like to go to Maine. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to leave my yard. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're there yeah like like i said it, it's it's an inter we're in an inter like this is an interesting point in history in the sense that um everybody everybody kind of feels like they're in jail and they're not entirely wrong it might be the <laughs> necess it might be the necessary thing but i'm not it's not right it's i wish I wish things had been done differently, but it is what it is. I mean, there's, it, we are where we're at and- Yeah, I think we all have that like jealousy over seeing Europe over the summer because they did such a strict lockdown that like once Europe opened back up for the summer, they were allowed to travel amongst themselves and vacation and they had a normal summer. Yet we were still like in the, the hell of it, not compared to where we are right now or where we started, but uh, yeah. It, well, it's also because Europe, okay, so probably the best country, in my opinion, that did the best was Japan. Yes. Like that's just my, that's my opinion. Um, Japan didn't really have to do a very hard lockdown for the longest time. I mean, they, they basically paid people to stay home, which was honestly a really brilliant way to do it, yeah. right? <laughs> right. But they've also got, they had the experience with the pandemics. They had the right, much more, they had a great experience with the pandemics. And... So they have a history of it. So does Europe, by and large. I mean, Britain's kind of insane. I, I, yeah. I don't, like, yeah. I'm kind of leaving them out. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. They're, the Britain's kind of insane. But, I mean, but, but I, like Czech Republic did really well. And I think a lot of these countries who at one point in time in their pseudo recent history who have been kind of violently taken over by another government, uh, they fall in line pretty easily. So when their government's like, stay home, they're like, fine. Well, it, it, it's it's also it. it's also I think I think the big thing no one really taught, deals with like I, I look at, okay so up here we are about to well, a lot of places are locking down for the second wave and that and and okay fine cool but here's the problem we're letting our kids back in school yeah. we're letting we're letting we we're letting beer stores stay open we're letting like Seven Eleven stores stay open so the, the big thing about North America like just from a purely point of view of integrity. There's a lot of hypocrisy on even in Canada about how we're dealing with this and it undermines the credibility of what everybody's saying. Whereas if you go to a lot of these other governments, it's very cut and dry. Like this is what we're doing. We're doing this with everything. We're not, we're not really playing the exceptions game anywhere. Right. Everything's in line. You're doing this. We'll pay you to stay home. Fuck this. Stay home. Right. Yeah. And if you do have to go out to the grocery store, it's only for certain hours and yeah, certain, well, yeah, only a few it, people. It, it, there, it's the point. same thing that happened during World War II. People yeah. had no problem locking down in World War II and putting up blackout curtains and being safe to keep everybody safe. But but there's but there's a consistency there, right? There's yeah. a lot more. There's a consistency. So you look at the you know, okay, okay, you you guys, never mind. We're not even going to go there. Yeah, we um, can't. It's a yeah, disaster. Yeah. yeah. Um, but even up here. We don't have the, we don't have the, um, what's the term? We don't have the integrity to say, look, 10 people can go into a store and that's it. But 200 kids can go out and interact with each other. I mean, like, I mean, there's that. There's like, again, but people can go in lines for a beer store or my personal favorite, you go to a restaurant, while you're up, you got to wear a mask, but literally you can go one step, sit down, take it off and eat. Yeah. Also, the people are handling your food. Right, so that glass they have is kind of pointless, and you kind of so you're looking at it, and again, you just think of you think about it just enough. You're looking at this, it's like what a blow, like what a load of shit. That's that's I mean that I mean that's the yeah. thing about Canada, that's the thing about the United States, the thing about even about Australia. We're young countries that haven't developed our own 
cohesive ways of dealing with this stuff. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think our yeah. country will send their kids back to school. They'll do, they claim they want to shut down. They want to flatten the curve, but they will not close down the bars. They will not close down the restaurants because God forbid you can't go out and eat in a crowded restaurant or go to a bar. Um, yeah. But I think th there's also a huge problem is, so our bars are still at 100% capacity where I live, even though you can't leave our state. Uh, other residents, people from Massachusetts can come here and eat in our restaurants and go to our bars. Massachusetts is closing in on 10,000 cases a day. They can come here. We're not stopping them because we need the revenue. Uh, you know, all of that is is well and good. Um, but and they're, all, they're, they're just they're also not shutting down like people who are having parties in their house. We have a neighbor who has a party at least every weekend. The houses are small. They're like little ranch houses. I see 15 cars, five people in each car, like piling in. And I'm like, ah. Uh. No. Well, but, but, that's, but again, there's no consistency. So, I mean, on one hand, you're like, yeah, what are you doing? But on the other hand, you're like, well, what are we doing? Right? I mean, it's it's hard to take it. It's hard to have a, 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 any semblance of credibility when you're not a consistent. Like I said, most of the countries that did really well, I look at Japan. They're very consistent. They don't, they don't fuck around. <laughs> right? They just like, they're very consistent. You can do this. You can do that. Up until like, I think very recently they handled it. Most of their problems came from the U.S. Marine days. But I mean, that was that was their big problem, right? South Korea, same thing. Singapore, same thing. They're like, you know what? This is how we're doing it, and you're gonna do it this way, and that's all there is to it. And because there's a very consistent, like this is it, this is out. There's no gray areas. There's no there's no wiggle room. People cooperate because again. You come across as credible, people will believe you. The moment you start doing the really fishy crap, <laughs> no one's going to believe you. And it doesn't matter what anything else says, right? That's kind of like, so it's kind of why I haven't blamed anybody for anything they're doing, really, because how can I? What example can I give them? <laughs> right. Um, I wish I was that benevolent. I'm still blaming people. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm like, ah, oh, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I know well, I want to go it, on freaking vacation. Yeah, no, I, I just, I just reckon, like, like I said, I, I, how can I be mad at someone going outside when I can, again, looking at kids going to school? Yeah, how can I no, be mad? I get like, it. Yeah, I, I can't do it because like, I think I'm looking at the people above me that let these things happen. Mm -hmm. You're letting this happen, so. Mm -hmm. Like again, and also that that's just me. I maybe I'm I maybe I am too benevolent, but that's just I, I, again I I'm of three minds about this whole thing. And when that that's the part of me, it's like if we had more integrity, everybody would fall in line. But yeah. we don't, and here we are. Don't I know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but oof, I want to keep talking to you, but you have to go. Sadly. I do have to go. I do have to go. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, uh, this is fun. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Ann Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So we never talked about anything you're doing. So I think this time, because we talked about your book on the... I know. Uh, yeah. I, I'm only showing it. Show it to it. the world. Show it to the world. Hi. This Hi. came out on Thursday. It's called When the Sleeping Dead Still Talk. I physically just got this in my hands right before our show. So that's the only reason why I'm showing it. No, no you should. By the way, oh. congratulations. That's awesome. That's very, very, very cool. I know. So it's the second book to this book. So if you're on Amazon, buy both. Um, Yay. So yeah, I, I normally never keep my books next to me when I do an interview, but like right before we started, I was just like looking at it going like, oh, it feels so nice. <laughs> and then you like, I'm like, oh, there's the link. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. This is, this is, uh, yeah, I did like, honestly, um, I really enjoyed this. This was fun. This was Thank a great uh, interview. I'm, I'm sad we can't go longer, but here's what we're gonna do. I can come back. You can definitely come back. Although it won't be, it'll have to be sometime in January or February where you have to come back. That's fine. That's yeah. Fine. I, I got. I got. <laughs> You're I, busy. I, I surprisingly got booked like really fast. It happens. It yeah. happens. It's crazy. When I started my podcast, I'm like, we're never gonna find guests. Oh crap, we're booked till January, and that was in July. And I yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. Ugh. 
yeah, I'm doing 20 episodes a month, and in three days, I filled. I filled. Yeah, this, this, no, this. I have a master plan with this, and uh, when you when you disengage, I actually explain the master plan. So hopefully, you listen to this, listen to it when it's over, and you, you'll hear it. But before you go, you do have a podcast. You should plug your podcast, and then anything else you want to plug besides your books. And okay. then you can disappear, and I, I'll wrap up. I'll disappear. Day. I'll fade away. Um, so, again, thank you. Thank you so much, Josh, for having me. Uh, people who are listening, I have a podcast. It's on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. It's called Vox Vomitus, and you can find us at Vox Vomitus Podcast on Facebook. That is where we live stream. Uh, then later on, you can do Vox Vomitus Podcast on YouTube, on Anchor, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on anywhere there's podcasts. Just search Vox Vomitus Podcast. Uh, this week we have author Simon Stevenson. Uh, it's always a good time where we drink and talk to authors about all the mistakes they've made in their writing. Uh, if you want to hear about the mistakes I've made in my writing, you can follow me on Facebook at Jennifer Ann Gordon Author. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram. Or the easiest thing to do is go to JenniferAnnGordon.com. That has all of my links there. It has everything about my book, When the Sleeping Dead Still Talk. Uh, my it's that's the second book in my hotel series it also has the information on my novel beautiful frightening and silent which has just recently won the kindle award for best horror uh it also was just named a finalist in the american book fest uh award for best horror novel of the year and it is up for it won best horror novel of the year through authors on the air and it is up for the it's in the top five of best book of the year for authors on the air which is crazy beans. Uh, so that is. Well, deserved. I, I, I actually. Beautiful, I want it. I'm going to probably have to pick up your books at some point. You might have to. Yeah. You might have to. You might have to. Uh, but they're all available on uh, Kindle and they're on Amazon and at bookshop.org if you want to, instead of uh, giving money to Jeff Bezos, give money to an independent bookstore, bookshop.org. Uh, all of this is on my website. And thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank I you. will. I will let you uh, do your master plan speech and okay. I will talk to you later. Excellent. Thank you. Have yourself a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. bye And so, and so Jennifer Ann Gordon was my first guest on the new show. So to everybody listening still. So this is what's happening. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays, I am doing interviews. Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays are going to be like interviews just like you see here. We're just going to talk about anything and everything and what we normally do. Friday is going to be kind of cool, though, because Friday is going to be my first ever drink and draw. Uh, my guest is Ann Vu. It's going to be kind of fun. It's going to air a little later in the evening, around 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and there's definitely going to be a schedule up with my streams from here on in. And so this is my first one on Twitch, my 451st episode. For those of you who have not been introduced to me, my name is Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff in podcasts, too. I do this, I've been doing this for five years. Uh, this is me taking what I've done to the next level. I am here to change. Basically, I, I've always wanted to do this. Like, I love hearing people tell their stories. And I love that, you know, that people are willing to trust themselves to come on here and we just talk about anything and everything. So how can you help me going forward? Well, I have a Twitch channel here, which is which hopefully you've listened to this way. Twitch.tv slash just Josh and Podcast. Hit the subscribe button. That'd be awesome. I'll be doing these things every night. Uh, you're going to see some clips come up here really shortly. I have a YouTube channel, which the episode will be there as well. I'm still going to do an audio podcast every night, pretty much Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Sunday is still going to be the reading episode, which is the only audio only thing left. Um, but in short... This is what I love to do, and this is what I'm going to do. And like we talked about in the podcast, this is about doing what you love. And especially in a time like this, when we're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow, you might as well look at the things that give you joy and do them. Because life is short, and you got to go for those things that really matter to you. Um, right? I, I said this in the podcast today here. Life is short on time, but long on possibilities. And hopefully, if you're listening to this or watching this, you feel that you can do these things now maybe especially now because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow and that's the one good and bad thing about this time you don't know what's going to come next that's a wonderful thing though too because anything can happen good and bad but anyways ladies and gentlemen this is my very first episode of the new format uh i want to thank my sponsor indie imprint for doing this you're still gonna i hear you'll hear them on the audio show i thank them very much for coming on board um if you want to support the podcast do so number just subscribe to my twitch my youtube 
or my regular podcast, which can be found anywhere. Buy my books, Alice Zero and The Cloud Diver, digitally on Amazon right now. Uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at jpentelaresco. All in all, guys, thanks for listening. Stay inspired, and I'll see you guys next time.